church, but today I am a defensive back for Coach Don Correa. We want to welcome all of you to our family. We have a lot of former players here, and uh, you are all our family. We are one team today to honor our friends, a guy we love and love watching him do his thing, being with him when he did his thing. So we want to thank you and uh, uh, welcome you to honor him today. I want to tell you a few things about him. By the way, I was talking to Billy Ray today, and, and I didn't know this, but he was telling me that the defense that we played on together in the early 80s were the reason that Air Coriel even existed because we were so bad that they had to be out there all day long. So I, I really feel good about myself today. Uh, Don David Coriel, also known as Pop, was born in Seattle, Washington, October 17, 1924. His middle name, David, he gave himself when he was about six years old after David and Goliath. I didn't know you could do that. He was married to Elisa Brunrose in 1956. They were married 52 years. She passed away December 27, 2008, after the Battle of Kansas. He was a boxer and paratrooper, first lieutenant in the Army when he was 21 years old. He played football at the University of Washington as a DB and a boxer. Uh, he coached at Wenatchee Junior College in 1955. They were Washington State, State Champs. He also coached at Fort Ord. They were 9 and 0. Coached at Whittier College. Uh, he also was a coach at USC where they developed the I formation. <coughs> coach at San Diego State. 1961 to 72, and uh, this is amazing. 104 wins, 19 losses, two times. Unbelievable. <laughs> St. Louis Cardinals, 1973 1977, coached the San Diego Chargers, 1978 86, and Coriel. He was inducted to the Hall College Hall of Fame in 1999, Wenatchee Junior College Hall of Fame, Aztec Hall of Fame, University of Washington Husky Hall of Fame, Charger Hall of Fame, and NFL needs to put him in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> he was the first and only coach ever to have 100 wins in college and the pros. Let me say that again. The first and only coach ever to have 100 wins in college and the pros. Passed away July 1st, 2010, 315 at Grossmont College. He was survived by his son Mike, who has a wife Debbie, two children, Cutter and Kelly. He was also survived by Mindy, his daughter, a husband Mike, a different Mike, and Lonnie, the daughter, 27. And on behalf of them, we want to thank you for coming here today. Uh, there was a uh, shepherd who was walking in the field with a bunch of sheep. And the shepherd was trying to get the sheep to go across the little bridge. And so the shepherd called the sheep over the bridge, and the sheep would go. Then the shepherd put some food on the bridge to try to coax them to come across the bridge, and the sheep wouldn't follow. Then the shepherd started yelling at them, and with a stick, they wouldn't go over the bridge. And the shepherd was thinking, how do I get them over this bridge? Because on the other side is green pastures. Good food for them. And so what he decided to do was to pick up this little baby lamb, the baby lamb that all the sheep loved, and he carried the baby lamb over the bridge. And then all the other sheep walked over the bridge. Sometimes um, it's not until someone goes to the other side of the grave that we start to think about God and start to think about how much we appreciate them. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to do two things. We're going to appreciate a man for his love, for his laughter, for his humility. And you're going to hear a lot of people talk about Don Correal. And I'm going to tell you, uh, it's all true. This is not one of those things where people just say nice things because uh, he passed away. He was a sweet man. And I, I played with him in 1982, 1985. Amen. And I was on the defense, so I wasn't in a lot of meetings with him, but I was around him all the time. He actually physically kicked me in my behind one time because I got a penalty. Uh, and he physically just put his foot. It didn't go in, but it just went on. It, but, uh, you know, it, was, it was close. But, uh, you know, five minutes later, he comes over to me. And he 
uh, just said, you know, to encourage me. He didn't want me to be discouraged. I wasn't discouraged, you know, I better tell him to move on. But that's the kind of guy he was. He said, I, I want to make sure that you're ready to do your job today. Um, so we're going to hear a lot of people say a lot of great things about him. We're also going to talk about what happens when you die. Because it's not until people die that we think about death. We think about what's going to happen when we die. And so we're going to do that as well. And so my prayer for you is that uh, God would encourage you today. And that you would be blessed today. That you would have fond memories of a great man. And that you would also think about your life as well. So before we go any further, let's just bow our heads and say a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much that you love us. We thank you so much that you know us. And we thank you that you gave us Don Correa. We thank you that you created him with the smile he had and the heart and the humility and the laughter. And how when he talked to you, you were the only person in the world. We thank you for his integrity. And Lord, I pray that as we remember him today, we want to be more like him. And also, we want to be more like you. Bless our time, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, thank you. Blossomed elsewhere. 
He made deep friendships that lasted a lifetime. He uh, enjoyed all manner of sports. Um, he explored and played at a time when there were few limits on where a kid could go to, to, uh, uh, to explore and play, not like, unlike today. But part of the best uh, thing about growing up is the family purchased a small lot on Vashon Island, Washington. This is right on the water. And they spent their summers there. Um, uh, at first, uh, Julie would take the boys and they would uh, have a, a, a pitch a tent and they'd live in the tent all the summer. Uh, his dad, George, would, would, would come uh, on weekends and whenever he could get away during the week from uh, work in Seattle. Uh, uh, for, for a young boy, what an environment. It was where the wilderness met the sea. Uh, uh, he explored, he fished, he swam, he rode his, his rowboat, or the family's rowboat, around the island, a distance of about 35 miles. The journey must have taken a week or two, but, you know, that's okay for a 10 year old, isn't it? A lot of freedom back then. Um, the only access to, to the property was, uh, by a trail from a park here about a half mile away. And I still remember my grandmother in her 80s, you know, first pushing a wheelbarrow, then later she get less, got more infirm, pulling a cart that half mile down the trail to get, the, get to the house and bring the groceries for dinner. Um, as pot grew and matured, um, so did the storm clouds of war. World War II. Like most of his generation, he enlisted as soon as he graduated from high school. He joined the ski troops, which later became as the 10th Mountain Warfare Division. He was uh, the first, uh, uh, the first group in the first group of folks. Uh, winter training was arduous, high in the mountains of Colorado. Uh, the attrition rate was huge; it was over 50 percent. Some of the men uh, would purposely let their hands and toes become frostbitten to, and, and eventually lost, many lost their toes or their fingers, so that they could escape the pain, the fatigue, and the agony of just the training. Uh, however, um, this environment was ideal for my dad. It was a challenge, it was uh, something he could he could work up to. There were people that needed help. He helped them. Uh, it, was a, it was a great experience for him. Uh, he quickly rose through the ranks and became a leader of some of those men. They were very tough men, the, the ones that survived. When it came time to deploy, to his disappointment, he was held back. It turned out that he was far too valuable as an instructor, a teacher, a leader, and a role model for the next batch of recruits to allow them to go to combat. These men of the next batch needed to become an effective fighting force under the most difficult conditions. That team needed a coach, and Pop, Pop did that, performed that function. But while he was doing this for the second batch of recruits, the first batch was fighting in famous battles in Italy. Um, unfortunately, most of them died in those battles. Um, that was a hard thing for Bob. But, as pro but during the war, progress was being made in Europe. There was less need for mountain warfare and more need for highly mobile highly deployable forces um, uh, to take and hold ground in the Pacific. So he transferred for the into the paratroops. Again he excelled, again he was held back from deployment. This time to attend Officer Canada School. 
His comrades, the people he trained and trained with, uh, did deploy off Japan. And they jumped out of an airplane near the Japanese coast. And the plane was slightly off course, and they all jumped into the sea, and they all died. Again, losing his comrades and friends weighed upon him heavily. Pop graduated from Officer's, Officer's Candidate School at age of 20, near the top of his class. But the war was soon over, and right after the war, he led a mechanized reconnaissance company in northern Japan. This time, not in combat, but in peace, helping the Japanese demilitarize, recover, and rebuild. But Pop's life in the Army was transformative. He entered a dyslexic, an average high school graduate who thought poorly of his abilities. He left a confident teacher, a team builder, and leader of men, but still dyslexic. After the Army, like so many others, Pop went to college on the GI Bill. Like his mother, he attended the University of Washington. But unlike his mother, he boxed and played football as a defensive back. He was a good football player and a better boxer, and eventually coached the boxing team. He left the University of Washington with a master's degree and started coaching, first in high school in Hawaii, then the University of British Columbia, then junior college at Wenatchee, Washington, and then military ball at Fort Ord. You may hear from others about my dad's coaching career. But the reason I mentioned Fort Ord is that's where he met my mom. My dad first saw my mom, Elisa, standing in line at bank and fell in love with her at first sight. This is, this is my mom. He, my mother was director of the service clubs in the Northern California region. And so my dad found occasion to visit the service club at Fort Ord. And before very long at all, they eloped to Las Vegas and married. <laughs> my dad loved my mom with the same depth and intensity evident on those first days, those first passionate days when they eloped throughout his life throughout their life together, to my mom's dying day about a year and a half ago, just after Christmas. He still, still loved her after she died and missed her terribly. When he was sick in hospital, this picture followed him everywhere. When San Diego State University gave him an honorary doctorate, here in this arena, not too long ago. My dad couldn't attend because he was too ill. He was at, in a high observation unit at Promise Hospital with, five, with a total of five beds. During that ceremony, his main concern was placing this picture in such a way so that each patient could look at my mom during that ceremony. That was and is his love for my mother. I expect that today you may hear more about my dad's love and caring for people around him, <laughs> his players, his coaches, his friends. But I want to mention his love and caring for his family. Like my mother, my dad never pushed Mindy or me but rather supported us in whatever path we chose. And finally, I want to leave you with two examples, personal examples of this love for me. Not love by words, but love by deeds. While coaching in St. Louis, um, I decided to go to school at University of California at San Diego. A year later, he joined me in San Diego, coaching the Chargers. Was this a happy coincidence? Maybe, but I've come to suspect that it was not so much of a coincidence as it might have appeared. 
Finally, you might imagine a coach's life is busy, and that's true. Often working 18-hour days, often sleeping in his office at the stadium to save the commute. His only luxury of time were a few hours Friday evenings where he had dinner with my mom. Yet, when I called him, maybe at 8 or 9 at night, which generally is during a coach's meeting, he would, without hesitation, suspend the meeting so he could talk in depth with me about whatever trivial concern I might have had. And then, when we're done, we continue the meeting, planning how to win the next game. I'd like to uh, uh, bring up Mike Lewis next to speak, uh, Don Sun. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for being here. It's, uh, it's just such a wonderful blessing to see not only the friends and family and former players and coaches but those of you from the San Diego community who have taken time out of your day here to, uh, to honor Pop, we appreciate it so much. This is to Pop. Pop, as you know, Mindy Alani and I haven't slept much over the last week and a half. We spent a lot of time worrying over preparations for this celebration and exactly what to say today as a family. As we write this, we're of course not sure exactly what Mike and his family will have said either, but we bet they have similar difficulty. And I know they did. The folks gathered here today mostly know you as Eric Coriel, but we want them to know you as we do. Over the years, you have had many roles and titles, many names, son, brother, coach, father, Vati, Dad and Pop. That last one is the person we want everyone to know about. When Lonnie was just starting to talk, she named her grandmother Booty. Everybody liked that one. She named her that because Mike had always called her Mooty, but Lonnie couldn't say that when she was two years old. So Booty it is, and Booty stuck. About the same time, she started to call you Pop. And what a perfect name that came to be. For Lonnie, it was a perfect expression for her loving, caring, and always proud grandfather, Lonnie's pop. Soon, Lonnie's cousins, Cutter and Kelly, as well as Uncle Mike and Aunt Debbie came to call you that too, because it just fit. Mike and Debbie, Cutter and Kelly's pop. For me, you were as much a father to me as my own dad and even more so after his passing. I will forever cherish the closeness of our relationship. You certainly were always and always will be my pop. For Mindy, the little girl you named Minnow, knowing your love for her for her entire life, but expressed in such a deep and personal way over the last few years, Minnow's loving pop. And finally, the joy we all had in the last several months with you living with us since Booty's passing. We will have wonderful memories for our entire lives of that time together with you, living in our home and enjoying the time that we had. Because every day, every day, we saw even more the kind of loving, kind, strong, caring person that we love so much. Our wonderful Pop.
<laughs> I could go on and on about what an amazing grandpa he was, but instead I would like to read an article I wrote about him a few years back for one of my classes here at State. I want you all to know what life was like for him post football. His jaws clenched, his brows furrowed, and his glare could make a grown man cry. For many years, he was a gruff coach in the NFL whose intensity off and on the field demanded perfection. His players respected him and the community loved him. His life was regimented and his mind was always focused on the next big play. There was little time for relaxation and pleasure until the day Don Coriel retired from football and never looked back. After dedicating the majority of his life to coaching, Coriel put the playbooks on the shelf and drifted into obscurity. So many years in the public eye had taken its toll. So one day Don and his wife Elisa packed up, moved out of crowded San Diego, and headed to paradise. Suddenly, Coriel's life no longer consisted of linemen, pigspit, pigskins, and hundred yard fields, but rather of fishermen, sea otters, and the endless Pacific. Home was now on San Juan Island in northern Washington, so close to Canada that no one had ever seen his face on television. Accessible only by ferry or seaplane, San Juan Island became the perfect retirement haven. Don wakes up every morning to the sound of bald eagles screeching in the nest nearby. A fresh pot of coffee greets him and he leisurely gets out of bed whenever he pleases. Once up and about, Don and Elisa will either go for a walk or a bike ride through the woods. It doesn't matter that they are in their 80s. It seems youth is a state of mind. Once a week, they will venture into town to pick up their mail at the post office and buy groceries at King's Market. Friday Harbor is no bustling city, but instead a quaint resort town with all the necessities for two self-described permits. Trips to town are an all-day affair, so the rest of the week leaves Don to do the things he loves best. Once or twice a day, Don has to check the crab trap, crab traps out in the little bay. This requires him to climb into the boat and drive a few years off three yards off the dock. The thought of him reaching